So I'm a scientist, and so that's why I will start with the science. Um, and I will really be the very basic science. We know that the climate is changing, and we also know why. Um, we have already one degree Celsius of global mean temperature higher than we had at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And we can attribute this one degree to the burning of fossil fuels from human activity. Um, so what do I mean with attributable? Well, attributable really just means we cannot explain what we observe without taking um, the burning of fossil fuels into account. So what we see here, and I'm pretty sure that you have seen versions of this graph before at some point, but it's still one of the most important graphs that we have when we talk about climate change. So what you see here, all these black dots and the black lines are observations of global mean temperature since 1850. And you can see that it's going up and down and up and down, but then since the 1960s, it's going pretty much um, in a relatively straight line up, although there's a lot of interannual variability. And you can see um, that we are now a bit above one degree warming higher than we were at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so what we want to do when we do attribution is we want to explain what we observe with what we know is driving the climate system. And when you look at these blue curve there, that is what the climate system response would be if we take only all the natural forcings that we know about into account. So changes in the solar system and the um, incoming solar radiation and climate deniers often use that a lot. Well, but it could be the sun. Well, if we do what, if we take into account what the sun is doing, and if we take into account, for example, volcanic eruptions, so that explain some of these dips. So the last big dip was Mount Pinatubo ex uh, explosion in 1991. Um, we can simulate some of the ups and downs, but we cannot reproduce the increase in global mean temperature that we observe at, since the 1960s if we only take natural forcings into account. And if you look at the orange line, that is if we only take human forcings, man-made forcings into account. So from burning fossil fuels, greenhouse gases, but also aerosols. Then we have this very straight orange line. So we also can't explain everything we see with just the human forcings, because then we don't get this interannual variability. But only when we combine the two, the natural forcings and the man-made forcings, which is the... Um, the red line, we can simulate and we can explain what we observe. And that is the key idea behind attribution. And so, of course, this is totally not new. So 1.126 degree is how it was in August. And of course, as long as we keep on burning fossil fuels, this number will rise. But this fact we have known for a very long time. But global mean temperature, is not killing anyone. Global mean temperature is a very abstract metric um, that we, is very useful in policy agreements, but it's not what people experience. How climate change manifests is through the changing likelihood and intensity of extreme weather events. And for a very long time, whenever um, an extreme event happens, people have asked the question, is this because of climate change? And for a long time, the scientific community have given two kinds of answers. The first one was, well, it's the sort of event we expect to see more of, or not, depending on the event with climate change, but we can't really attribute individual events. Or people have said, well, we're living in a world where climate change is happening, so of course climate change is playing a role. And the letter is trivially too, but it doesn't tell you anything about how climate change is playing a role, whether the event is being made more likely or less likely or much more likely or no change at all. But this has changed. So now we can actually attribute individual weather events. We will never be able to say that an event was caused 
only by climate change, because if you boil down to them, every extreme weather event uni is unique, and there's always a combination of different causes. So that just the chaotic variability of the weather plays a role. Um, it plays a role of whether or not the spring was dry or wet. It plays a role whether the event is playing out over a city or a forest. Um, but man-made climate change can increase the intensity and the likelihood of the event to occur. And that is what we do with event attribution. We simulate what is possible weather in the world we live in today, and then we simulate what is possible weather in a world that might have been without man-made climate change, so in a very similar way as, as here. And when we see that the likelihood of the event that we are interested in, say, the heat wave that I guess most of us who have been in Europe this summer have experienced one of three heat waves, and the heat wave, for example, in France, it was, in today's climate, about uh, a one in 30 year event. So in every given year, you had a one in 30 chance for this event to happen. But in a world without climate change, this event would have been extremely rare. It would have been um, rarer than uh, a one in 300 year event. And because the only thing that is different between these two worlds that we can simulate and that we can simulate using observations and statistical modeling and climate models, we can attribute this difference to climate change. And so we know that climate change has made this heat wave that we have just experienced um, uh, at least 10 times more likely and possibly much, much more. So now we have develop this science, and this is an overview that um, Carbon Brief, um, a climate and energy news website, has put together uh, earlier in the year, where they took all the studies of extreme event attribution that have been done, which are about 190 together. So these are all the extreme events where we know what the role of climate change is. And when you look at this map, you will see that there's a lot of red, so that's all the events where climate change is playing a role in making the event more likely and more intense. There are some blue events where climate change is not playing a role, and there are also some gray ones, and these are the ones where we can't say, because we don't have enough observational data um, to know what actually happened, or we do not have climate models that are able to reliably simulate this type of event. But what is much more striking about this map is that it's hugely biased. So we do know very well for a lot of extreme events that have happened in Europe and in North America and in Australia what the role of climate change is. But for a lo lot of other parts of the world, we don't know. Because, um, well, for once, climate scientists are sitting mostly in Europe, Australia, North America, and so they are attributing events that are happening in the backyard. Um, but of also, um, there is just much less data available in other parts of the world. So we still do not have a very full, complete picture of what are the impacts of climate change today. Um, but we have made a huge step forward in understanding what does climate change mean for, for all of us and today. And the main thing that we, that we learn from that is that on the one hand, climate change does not mean the end of the physical world, and it also does not mean the end of humanity. But it does mean that with all these extreme events that are happening, and even if the change in the hazard, so the intensity, is small. It is those who are most vulnerable and most exposed who are paying with losing their livelihoods, with losing a lot of money, with losing their lives for climate change. So what climate change really is, is a social problem. It increases the social inequalities that we already have in the world, and it destroys some of the development gains that, that we have seen. And so, um, how we are impacted by climate change, so much depends on where we live, but really who we are and how vulnerable we are. And the key question is how you are impacted by climate change 
is how you're governed. So governance is the strongest indicator how able we are um, to be adapt to climate change and, and how resilient we are to, to the changing physical world. And there are very simple facts of what we knew, need to do about climate change. So first thing is, um, or the one thing is we need to stop burning fossil fuels. But how we actually do that is not straightforward. And the impacts are messy, and it's a messy world we live in, so also the solutions are messy and are complicated, and there is not the one straightforward way to do this. So we need many, many different solutions to deal with climate change. And this means that we know the facts, but knowing the facts is really just the very first step. Knowing the facts doesn't lead to action. And action needs to look very different and needs to include really everyone and all parts of society. The Paris Agreement, which all states have so far ratified, um, says there is common and differentiated responsibility in dealing with climate change. And in the parent agreement, this holds for states, so because developed states can pay more and have also more historic responsibility. But this also holds for individuals. And this is um, very important for every one of us when we talk about climate change and how we frame our discussions around climate change. Because it is very important that we don't mix structural with individual responsibility and structural with individual solutions. So when we talk about climate change nowadays, a lot of the discussion is about flying, flight shame, or individual behavior change. This is really only a very small part of the solution. If we want to hold climate change, if we don't want temperatures to rise further than two degrees or three degrees, then we need to stop burning fossil fuels. And we are currently living in a world that is built on burning fossil fuels. So all our infrastructure system, all our systems are so that we rely on the burning of fossil fuels. And only the most privileged people can actually afford to not burn fossil fuels. If you are poor, you can't live in the city center and cycle to work. And you can't live in a house that is perfectly insulated. So by focusing the debate only on individual actions, we are actually, again, looking at the problem from a very privileged point of view. But it is, climate change is and a question of inequality. And to solve it, we need to solve it with, through that lens. And so every one of us, I think, ha needs to think about in our sphere of influence, and whether that is massive because you are a journalist in a big newspaper, or whether it's very small and you're a teacher in a school, we all have opportunities to frame the debate, so to point to the structural problems, and we need to bring the carbon majors on board. The businesses that are relying on fossil fuels, they have to change their business model, otherwise it's, we will not find a solution. And at the moment, they are very happy that we all just talk about flying, because no one is even challenging them. And we can all do that. However small your sphere of influence is, we can all think about where do we have an entry point into making some structural changes. And that, that is really the only thing that will solve the climate problem. Thank you.